All right, welcome back to a bonus episode of the Blasters and Blades podcast. So, hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans, time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies, a place where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place. So without further ado, let me tell you what we're doing right now. We're getting ready to uh, release some of the archive that we found from when we were the sci-fi shenanigans. Uh, we're going to get those up there for, for the posts that were brought down. We thought you might enjoy them. Um, and so without further ado, let us uh, let us roll that beautiful... Oh, wait, they're going to sue me. Play it. Hey, all you crazy sci-fi fans. Time for your daily dose of insanity over here at the Sci-Fi Shenanigans Podcast. Just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions. A place where the sky's the limit, space is the place, and nerds run the world. And without further ado... All right, welcome back to another episode of the Sci-Fi Shenanigans Podcast. Today, as our special guest, we have returning veteran of the podcast, Jonathan Yanez. Yay! Woo-hoo, yay! Yeah, and hey, his uh, his new friend, he picked him up on the side of the road, felt sorry for him. He said, we'll write for food, and, and the rest is history. But we've got Ross Bazell. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> Did I pronounce it anywhere close to in the right hemisphere? That was actually perfect. Typically, I get buzzle or boozle, so... Thank you. <laughs> right right See, now I want to drink. I know, Curse right? You. All right. All right. So the second part of the introduction, dear listener, is we say, oh, actually, first I got to do the introduction before I can say how we met them. So, all right. Pretend you didn't just hear me mess up and, and Winder will edit this out, I'm sure. All, <laughs> all right. right. So. <laughs> so so jonathan according to his profile he's more animal than man he bleeds caffeine and okay i'm just kidding uh it sounded cool though right so he writes because that's what he was born to do and he freaking loves doing it and when he's not writing crazy stories he's at home with his wife and young daughter creating crazy stories with them uh, memories ah uh, memories and then we have ross bazell normally we steal from his bio of our guests from their amazon page because hey work smarter not harder right but his is blank so ross isn't real but in a high hypothetical context how would you introduce yourself to our listeners ross oh well um i uh in a hypothetical context i guess um since i am coming to you from the void um i'm a world traveler who uh has had um some amazing opportunities to see uh different multiple different countries of this amazing uh, of this amazing planet that we live on and uh, that has actually helped me develop uh the creativity that um I use in my writing today. So where all have you gone? Anywhere cool that you want to share before we jump right in? Well, I was born in Rota, Spain. Um, I lived in Sweden for about four years. I spent about a year of my life in France, um, in Paris. And then um, when my dad was stationed in Bahrain, went to visit him. And because my parents are really big on the whole road trip thing, we have hit probably, I want to say, 18 countries. Wow. Nice. So, yeah. Well, now if you ever go back, it's tax deductible because you're a writer. That is true. <laughs> Just <the research. laughs> write a short story, write a short story set wherever, and then it's research. But yep. all right, dear listener, the second part of the introduction is not to talk about the IRS, it, but to talk about where we first met them. So actually, Yanez found me, which was a first for us. We were both in the same, uh, some of the same professional writer type groups and knew some of the same people. So he reached out and introduced himself. Um, and we've had a lot of fun talking about books in uh, the intersuing years, intervening, intersuing. See, I'm making up words left and right here, people. You'd think I was writing another Tolkien novel. Uh, and the rest, as they say, is history. And as for his co-author, Ross, well, we met at – and that's how we averted disaster and saved the world. So was that about right, Ross? Actually, that, that's very, very accurate. <laughs> okay. What about you, Chris? I, I first met Jonathan at a writing event in Las Vegas. Um I'm not sure if I've met Ross yet. I don't think I have, except I'm not yet. I mean, that's where most of our friends come from, right? Because we're writers. We don't get outside. We're really pale and, you know, we don't even comb our hair. That's kind of how it goes, right? You have hair? I Oh, I have hair. Ah, okay. Does Ross have hair? I, I do. Okay. It's a mess right now, though. Exactly. We're writers. <laughs> All right. So... We'll be asking all of these questions in alphabetical order so we can prove that Marines can actually read. 
Uh, and since it's been, because, uh, you know, Winder has to ask some of these questions. And since it's been uh, 50 episodes or so since Jonathan was last on, he gets to answer too. But, uh, John, don't steal the limelight. Give us the Reader's Digest version so your friend can talk from the void. We might not never find, you know, the right interdimensional portal and stuff again. Are you talking about, like, what I've been up to or, like, books that I've written? No, 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 no. We're about to do the uh, the introductory choose your religion question, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The one where you ask, um, do I bow the knee to Star Wars, Star Trek, or Firefly? Well, well you're stealing um, Winder's thunder, <laughs> but, but, but Winder, well, um, since you can you ask the question? <laughs> <laughs> All right, the religion question. I have my mouse over the kick button. Star Wars, Str- Star Trek, or Firefly? So last time I was on, I cheated and I asked if I could go um, Stargate and you guys said yes, kindly. But so this time I will play by the rules and I'll choose out of those three. If I had to choose out of those three, I think I'd go Firefly. Good answer. Ah, purist, yep. All right, now let's see what Ross does. And honestly, um, I was, I've been thinking about that uh, for a while now and I have to say Firefly too because... Oh. In neither Star Wars or Star Trek does anyone say, I swear by my uh, floral pink bonnet, I will end you. <laughs> <laughs> Why isn't this kick All right. <laughs> <laughs> You broke okay, the internet, get to stay. <laughs> All right. So first, Jonathan, why do you love science fiction as a genre? I think it's just because it's unlimited possibilities. Like I always imagine us as writers – uh, we must feel like the way artists do when they're staring at a blank canvas when we open up, you know, whatever we write in, whether it's Microsoft Word or something else. It's kind of like the possibilities are endless. And since I don't outline, I'm just a pantser. I'm just kind of like along with the ride. I'm hanging out with these characters and we're, you know, discovering aliens and there's explosions going off and there's these dark, deep secrets of the galaxy we're finding out together. So definitely it's because of the unlimited possibilities. Okay, and so uh, he, he mentioned about the writing venues, and I have to say, just, this is where I take my stand and send the hate mail, but it is Word and Times New Roman or bust. <laughs> None of this other nonsense out there, you heathens on Scrivener. All right, I've said my piece. <laughs> take that, Josh Hayes. <laughs> okay, Ross, same question. What do you love about science fiction as a genre? Um, well, what I love about science fiction is, is a genre, wow, I can't speak today, um, is similar to what Jonathan said. It's absolute unlimited potential, um, especially as somebody who jokes that he should have become a scientist. Um, hmm. I like I like to look at the technology that we have now and take it to its logical conclusion, and you can't get fantastical like that at least in from what I've experienced outside of science fiction. And I mean, perfect example is look at how Star Trek is uh, shaped technology today. Mm, yeah. Hey, Winder, you hmm. think he, he was, was he in our graduating class at uh, hand wave MU? I think so. All right. I, I thought I recognized a fellow alumnus <laughs> <laughs> or is it alumni? I get it confused. For those for those who don't know, hand wavium is this magical element that when you can't explain it, you put your hands up in the air and you wave them, and that's you explaining how this scientific thing works. <laughs> All right, so oh, go ahead. And we re- we really should make that like merch. You should design like a school logo, and we sell T-shirts for hand alumni for hand wavium. You. It would confuse so many people. I know. <laughs> I, I tell you, I. I won't say who, but I had dinner with a very, very educated person, and I sat down at the table, and this person stared at me and stared at me and stared at me and said, will you stand back up, please? So I stood back up, and I have a hand wavium shirt, and it's got the, you know, got the the element symbol, and it's like, uh, you know, the atomic weight is (laughs) (laughs) 139-ish. And uh, this person is looking at me and says, there's a joke in there somewhere, I'm sure, but I don't think that's real. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> like, it's 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 not it's a joke well what's the joke uh you won't get it <laughs> if i haven't explained <laughs> it you're not gonna get it <laughs> That's awesome. all right so, so so next question so jonathan what's your first memory of watching reading or playing games in the science fiction genre um i think it was star wars so growing up we didn't watch a lot of TV, so it was kind of like a big deal when you got sick. Mm, you yeah. know, 
you're recovering, you're recuperating, so you're allowed to sit in front of the TV for a few hours on end. So back in the days of old when VHS was a means to watch tapes, to watch films, uh, I think somebody lent our family the first three Star Wars movies because um, we were sick. And so I was able to sit down. I can't remember how old I was, but super small, maybe six or seven. And then sit down and be able to watch those movies and then just being like my mind being blown <laughs> by this amazing story and universe that was unfolding in front of me. And back when we were that age, we don't scoff at these zooming sounds as the spaceship goes by in the vacuum of space. <laughs> yeah, I always think it's weird too. Like I do that to myself sometimes when I'm watching something. It's like, okay, I was like, okay, this is too much. But it's always interesting to me where everybody chooses to draw the line. Yeah. Right? Because some people will draw the line like, oh, this could never happen. But I'm like, like even when we get reviews in our books, they're like, well, you can't have a talking dog. That could never happen. I'm like, dude, we're intergalactic space travelers, and you were okay with that. And now all of a sudden I introduce you know, this talking dog character, and that's where you draw the line? So like, for my for my first series, I had uh, who's – not – I used an old form of like huzzah or something because I wanted it to be like not too American, but not like pinning it down to any one space marine type country. And one of the comments was, Marines don't say that. They say whatever, oorah or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, but space Marines do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, stuff like that. And like, I get it. I don't think that I'm free of that too. Like, I even see myself doing it. Like, I'll enjoy a story or a movie. And then sooner or later, when things get more ridiculous and more ridiculous and more ridiculous, and finally I'm like, okay, this is where they lost me. I can't do it anymore. <laughs> so I think we all have that point. So I'm not yeah. going to lie. I even add the zooming sounds when I'm driving down the interstate. <laughs> <laughs> all right, okay. Ross, save us from ourselves. Yep. So what's your first memory of watching, reading, or playing games in the sci-fi genre? Um, I think I would have to think it was watching uh, because my babysitter at the time was really big into Star Trek. Um, and so I think I – if my memory serves me correctly, my first memory was Star Trek, The Next Generation. Um, so Jean-Luc wow, okay. Picard. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that's – and, of course, um, as soon as I discovered Star Wars, I, uh, <laughs> I immediately migrated to the lightsaber. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever try to use the Force? Oh, my goodness. Um, I was very gullible as a child and actually was convinced by some neighbor kids that I was force sensitive. So, yes, I desperately tried to use the force on more than one occasion. Have you seen that commercial where that's for a car and the kid's out there in his uh, Darth Vader outfit and he's like trying to use the force and the parents are in there hitting the button, turning the car on or off. So he thinks he's doing it. Yes. That is a great commercial. <laughs> that was my childhood. In a nutshell, I relate right to now. that child so yes. much. <laughs> <laughs> that, that child, by the way, when it was filmed about mm, two or three years ago, was actually Winder. He was kneeling. <laughs> All right. So, Jonathan, how'd you go from liking or loving the sci fi genre into writing it? Did you start with sci fi or did you start with something else? No, I've been at this since, um, let's see, eight years now it would be 2011, 2012 is when I started writing. And I started off in urban fantasy. And then in 2017, so two and a half years ago, about, I started writing sci-fi because, I mean, I'm not sure if everybody's going to agree with me on this one, but I feel like when you write character-driven stories, that those same characters, those same tropes, those same types of people, whether you put them in an urban fantasy setting with like magic and werewolves, or you put them in space with aliens, they're still the same people. Uh, like James Bond is a good example, right? So we had, and Sherlock Holmes too. Both those guys have been characterized like way back in the day, um, going through their different missions and their different storylines. And even currently now, when, you know, now we have social media and the landscape has changed, but they're the same character. So even though I started off in urban fantasy, sci-fi was like a really smooth transition into that. It makes sense. What about you, Ross? How'd you get, how'd you get into writing sci uh, science fiction? Um, well, actually, uh, whenever, whenever I moved to Sweden, um, I was in the ninth grade, so I was 14 years old. And a big, and my sister and I, were, we were put in a, uh, a boarding school, which was an amazing experience because we got to be immersed in the culture. Um, but along with that came culture shock. So um, instead of like... Uh, 
like lashing out or whatnot that a lot of the American kids experienced whenever they were going through culture shock, um, I developed a science or a sci-fi uh, character that I would just write little short stories in and um, put him through what I was going through as sort of a coping mechanism. Um, wow. And then, uh, yeah, so I, I always started with uh with sci-fi and it was it started off as a coping mechanism for culture shock dang ross's answer is so much better than mine <laughs> <laughs> i'm thinking i'm thinking most authors well i don't know most I, i'll say i know a lot of authors who write and especially pantsers it's it's therapeutic because a lot of stuff comes out you really if you're not planning it in advance if you're if you're if you're writing into the dark uh, a lot of you goes into the book. Yeah, that that is really true. And having used it for therapeutic purposes, it's it's a good way to work through any issues that you might not be able to uh, um, to vocalize to another human being. Right, right. Because it happens in the imaginary. It's safe. It's distant. So, listeners, mm-hmm. uh, you want to give writing a shot? There's a good reason to give it a shot. Right there. Nobody else has to read it. You can burn it afterwards, but it might make you feel better. <laughs> All right. So transitioning away from the writing side, let's talk about things from a fan angle. Have uh, So, Jonathan, who's been the largest influence in your writing? Is it a particular author or a movie or a book series? Is there anyone you try to emulate or outdo? Dang, that's a good question. I should have read the show notes that you gave me to prepare for this. Um <laughs> Anybody that I try to emulate or outdo, definitely not outdo. Because, I mean, I feel no, like I the, only person that I'm, <laughs> <laughs> the only person that I'm trying to uh, outdo is myself and, like, the last book that I wrote. So I try to outdo myself every book. But, I mean, growing up, I read, I uh, cut my teeth on Tolkien and C.S. Lewis with The Lord of the Rings and Chronicles of Narnia. Mm-hmm. So again, I just keep on going back to even though I'm writing sci-fi now, there's so many different characters and elements of fantasy that I work into my story. Because I mean, when you look at it, like an alien could look like whatever you want. So why couldn't alien just look like a troll? In my latest series, sure. they're like trolls with four arms and six eyes, but they're still like these big green beans. Yeah. Okay. What about you, Russ? Um, well, I'm, I'm right there with Jonathan as far as the outdo, but I'm not, I'm not really looking to outdo anybody except for myself. Um, I make each next book better than the last, but, um, I, Frank Peretti is who I grew up reading. Um, and, uh, of course, Tolkien, um, and Narnia, the, the sort of quintessential, um, but a lot of it was actually screenplay. So like I would read screenplays cause they were a little bit easier for me to read since uh, I'm dyslexic. And, uh, so I, that's kind of how I got into the, the reading was just through, uh, sci- sci-fi screenplays. Screenplays. I never thought about that. I don't think I've ever read a screenplay. Uh, I mean, I, mean, Shakespeare, I, mean, I guess when you were in school. Yeah. But yeah, they're, uh, they're spaced out, uh, the way they're structured is there's a lot of space in them. Um, and for dyslexic people, whenever they look at a, a page, it all turns into one word. So like for me, it takes me about 45 minutes to read a single page of, uh, from a book. Um, but with a screenplay, I can go through it pretty quickly cause there's so much space in it, which is one of the reasons why, uh, um, space is at least for me is very important in a book. Oh, very interesting. Does that mean as, as somebody with dyslexia that you're all about the audiobooks now? I am very much about the audiobooks. I am loving them right now. I'm working on uh, Terry Goodkind's Legend or uh, Legend of the Seeker was the TV show. Um, the Sword of Truth series. Uh, awesome. I love it. Okay. Now into the question that I wanted to ask next. So uh, getting away from the writing side, talking about things from a fan angle. Have either of you gotten any cool fan art or had a fan cosplay any of your characters yet? Um, I haven't had anybody cosplay my character. I've had people go to cons and take pictures for me and send them to me of like um, people dressed up of what they thought my characters look like. Like I wrote an Archangel War series. So there was um, one of my readers went to a con and she saw a bunch of people dressed up like uh, angels. And she's like, oh, this is exactly what I imagine the Archangel Wars characters to look like. And then as far as art, I've been fortunate enough to 
um, have befriended a lot of artists that are also readers. So I've gotten multiple different pieces of artwork for a series that I did called the Dread Novels. Uh, my publisher still owns the rights to that series, but as soon as I get the rights back, I definitely plan on launching, relaunching that. And that's probably where most of it come from. I got some Archangel Wars um, artwork from fans. I used to have a section on my website, on my old website before it got redone, where fans could post art. I think I need to do that again. Oh, that'd be fun. With the no, no normal, usual uh, legal disclaimer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing I have to report to the police here. Please don't post that stuff. <laughs> yeah, maybe I need to rethink. Maybe I won't put that <laughs> section up on my maybe website. Maybe if you just have to approve it first, so that way you can like vet it. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'll send them all to JR first to vet. Yeah. Be like, JR, if your eyes don't bleed after looking at these, maybe we can post them. <laughs> <laughs> you, you do know what passes for uh, for art in the infantry might not be what you want your uh, professional image to look like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ross, anybody cosplay your stuff or give you any fan art yet? Um, I haven't had any fan art or um, any active cosplay. Uh, somebody that I worked with that, made, that bought one of my books, he did make an armor set of uh, one of the bad guys from my first book. Oh, wow. Um, but he never – he made it out of homemade warbla, which was pretty cool, um, but never uh, never actually had a chance to wear it out and about. Um, and then a college friend of mine, he, uh, he enjoyed – Again, my, my first series so much that he actually – he does short stories. He actually wrote one of my characters into his short stories and sent it to me, which is pretty cool. Oh, that's cool. Okay. Uh, so what's the uh, weirdest or funniest story about an interaction with a fan that you've had since you started writing Jonathan? Oh, man. I mean, I'm pretty – That you can pretty... tell us about. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty easy going and laid back, and I don't think anything's going to happen. Um, so there's been a couple times where like fans wanted to send me stuff and I'm like, yeah, you could just send it to my house. So I just give out my address. So I've gotten stuff from like homemade knitted scarves to cookies huh. and stuff for my daughter. So my wife and I go back and forth whether I'm too trusting, shouldn't give out our address, <laughs> but I'm like, nah, dude, these people are fine. They're friends. Now remember That's before cute. you keep talking, you did sign a non-disclosure agreement about our little situation. Yeah. We're not supposed we're not to talk, supposed about, talk about, that. about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ross. Any uh, any inter- interesting interactions? Um, as of right now, I wouldn't say that there has been. I mean, I've had I've had people like contact me and um, ask me about like deep lore for the Ooh. four books that aren't in the books that are just sort of my own head canon that uh, I don't intend on putting into anything. But other than that, and I think that's that's pretty cool that people are really interested in the actual deep lore that's never actually going to go on to a published page. Oh, at least yet. That is good. Except uh, once you do it, you're going to have to write it down so you don't forget. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Just in case. <laughs> That's, that's yeah. it, well i have i have it all written up on a document i just i don't intend on publishing it i should say okay that's it's one of my worst fears is either someone's going to cosplay a character and i'm not going to recognize who it is <laughs> or we're going to have a have a sit down and they're going to ask me questions about a character and i'm not going to remember which book it is that's my worst fear dude i could definitely see that happen especially as the years pass and you write more and more books you could definitely yeah. easily forget about a character, you know, like 30, 40 books down the road. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, JR. All right. So this is the part where I normally list out the various series that Jonathan has written, but he's too dang pro- prolific. Uh, and we want to let his co-author get a little bit of the limelight today. So instead, I will point out, one, that Jonathan's been on the show twice before and that those uh, episodes will be linked in his show notes. And uh, two, uh, Jonathan's about to give us a primer on where we can go to get information about the various universes he writes in. So, Jonathan. Yeah, so if you just go to uh, jonathan-yanyas.com, that's my website, and you can see a bunch of the series. Or just type my name into like Google or Amazon. Uh, it's Y-A-N-E-Z, and then you can take a look at a couple of stuff. I've done, like I said, everything from urban fantasy early on to um, like post-apoc, sci-fi, lit RPG, all that good stuff. So I slave away, dear listener, on these show notes in advance so everybody knows the, the script and nobody reads it. I need a minute. You're supposed to tell people about your reader's group. So, <laughs> uh, I also have a reader's group on Facebook. 
Um, it's uh, if you go to Jonathan's Reading Wolves, put that into Facebook, and you can find a readers group there as well. I appreciate you, JR. <laughs> it's, uh, it'll be in the show notes. Uh, it's it's a fun group. I'm actually a member myself. I feel like that hair club guy. Like I'm not just a president. I'm a client too. All right. Anyway. I'll, I'll move on from my dad joke. So uh, now I'll list out the various series that his co-author Ross has written. We have the Legends Online series, the Baronian uh, Rising Tide, the Baronian Zero Chronicles, the Baronian Birth of the Light, uh, Zero Chronicle Invasion, and the Embered, Embered Ed Lord series. Wow, that's a tongue twister. It's supposed to be Embered Lord. I think there might have been a, um, a misprint. Whoops, I need to fix that. Okay, I could just be pronouncing it wrong. Never underestimate infantry reading skills. <laughs> so, all right. So, I've looked at all of your your books and and each of your vast cornucopia of selections. See, I'm trying to throw out big words and sound smart people after the that whole infantry thing. Uh, and they all sound amazing. But today, we're going to look at the Legends Online series, specifically Genesis, a lit RPG journey. Because uh, while the cover looks fantasy to me, Amazon says it's science fiction. And that's our uh, our guiding light. Our northern star is the great and mighty Zahn, the oracle of all things holy and good and right. So how did you come up <laughs> with the premise uh, for this series? Where did the spark of inspiration come? John or Ross, jump in. Ross, I'll let you um, take this one. You well, it sounds good. Uh, well, for this one, when uh, um, I approached Jonathan about uh, working together on a, a topic, he told me that lit RPG was really big right now. And so I did a little bit of, of looking into it. And the great part that I noticed about lit RPG is that it's just, uh, it boiled down its video game systems in the, uh, at their logical conclusion. Yes. And, uh, and my father-in-law is, he works with mocap and VR. So motion capture and virtual reality uh, process. Like the first time I ever saw him, he, uh, he came up from the basement and he was in one of those mocap suits with the little balls on it, which is oh. absolutely cool. Um, and so, uh, and uh, so, yeah, the, what I did is I just, um, what inspired it was some of the conversations I've had with my father-in-law about um, how, VR and motion capture can change in the future. And I just sort of ran with it to its potentially logical conclusion. Hmm. Do you think it's going to be a happy conclusion or a sad one in real life? Let's say 50 years from now. Um, 50 years from now, I, I would say that with the technology that we have now, it could, it, it's just like fire. It depends on how people ah. use it. Um, it could be used for good or it could be used for bad. And, um, but I, I like to think that it is for a, a happy conclusion. Okay. So before we dig in, this cover clearly shows that you wrote a lit RPG novel. Yeah, paste it right there on the front. So we've interviewed authors in this genre, but those books kind of skirted around what made this subgenre unique. So you... To, as a subject matter experts, what do you think defines, really defines the lit RPG subgenre? We'll start with Jonathan. I think it's the specifics of the game mechanics, like the leveling system and the weapon systems that you find and how your character progresses through the storyline that really sets it apart from any other genre. Okay. So, uh, what about you, Russ? Oh, sorry. I was say, so when you say the game mechanics and the leveling system, so like I'm thinking like I've played Skyrim, right? So it's got a, a leveling system. Do you actually show like, okay, we're going to put points into this category and points into that category, like uh, like an MMORPG? Or do you just say they leveled up and they spent the points? No, I think you hit the nail on the head with using that analogy with Skyrim because Ross actually played Skyrim. And I think that's one of the first, um, when we were talking about doing this project together, that was one of the first... Um, conclusions he drew it from too he's like oh yeah he's like i love skyrim and what ross has done has been like really um unique and different in the way that when he's writing like the game mechanics part he's able to keep track of everything like super detailed and put these different leveling up systems in specific categories like this amount goes to strength this amount goes to you know durability and keep track of the weapons as well. Okay. Okay, so um, I, I've heard lit RPG and game lit. Are they the same thing, or are they something different? 
from the different like research points that I've seen as I've seen that lit RPG is a little bit more hardcore. Like they're doing what Ross and I are doing, keeping track of the mechanics, making sure that different ability points are specifically going into different systems where my understanding of game lit is that they're maybe a little bit more relaxed. They're not as detailed. So lit RPG is just a little bit more crunchy. Okay. Yeah, and then Ross can Ross came up with our leveling system. So Ross, if you want to talk about that a little bit, I know you got a lot of. Um, I think you said you pulled some from Skyrim, right? What you were doing with our leveling system? Yes, actually, that was that was definitely a um, uh, and in the inspiration behind how uh, how to do the leveling system, especially in this uh, style of lit RPG. Um, so yeah, there is like. Um, when the character sneaks around, uh, if he's not seen, which isn't always successful, Mm -hmm. if he's not seen his, uh, sneak skill levels up. So he's able to access more advanced versions of sneak, um, which cost more skill points. Um, but, uh, just because a sneak levels up doesn't mean that he levels up. So he has to, um, at least starting out, he has to build his stats in order to build his level. Okay. Okay. That, that's good adding limitations on the characters too. It makes them work harder. So when you played uh, Skyrim, which faction did you side with? There is a wrong answer, sir. Oh, yes. Well, um, the first time I played it through, I sided with the Stormcloaks because I'm a big av- or a big believer in the freedom of religion. Um, and then, of course, the second time I played through, I played through as the Empire. And then the third time, I didn't choose a side. Uh, I'm glad you weren't one of those imperial scum. All right. <laughs> uh, all right. So, uh, is there any trope that you have to include or exclude to make you, to make a, a story better and serve the audience? Like, what, what what's probably the most important trope in lit RPG? What should what should all readers expect from a good story? Uh, we'll start with Jonathan. I think the um, when we were doing research into lit RPG and what the readers wanted. A big trope was uh, like a comedic character. Like he could still be our hero and he was still, you know, um, um, the quest leader and he was still chivalrous. But I think there was a heavy comedy aspect, almost like, have, did you guys see Jumanji? I did. Yeah. Yeah. So almost like that, right? So that's lit RPG. They're in a game. That's more like game lit. So, right. They're not like going like crazy hard into like categories and leveling ups and weapons. So mm. Jermond is probably closer to Gamelet. But yeah, so they really hit the nail on the head with the comedy aspect. So I know that was a must for us when we were writing that we wanted to make sure that even though our characters were in these serious situations, that it wasn't all dark. I was um, listening to an interview. I think it was with Joss Whedon. He was saying that the reason that uh, his characters do so well in the Marvel movies that he worked on is he made sure that when the odds are stacked against the heroes when the night was at its darkest. They realized that, but then somebody cracked a joke. <laughs> okay. Yeah. T- t- take a little bit of the tension away, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Like build those elements, but don't just like leave your reader or viewer sitting in that moment, like give them some hope. Hmm. Okay. All right. Well, before we move on with even more, Oh, actually no first Ross, you get to answer the question before we pause for a commercial. Uh- Oh, that sounds good. Um, well, for me, like one of the, the big tropes for, uh, for the lit RPG, um, that I wanted to do was a sort of, it was of course the, uh, the humor aspect and everything, but also a companion system. Um, because of, uh, well, because it's a, a new world and like, w- for example, when you join Skyrim, the first thing that happens, depending on who you decide to get away from Helgen with, you have, even though it's a short uh, section, you have a companion system where it's not, uh, where it's not an escort mission or anything like that, but where they fight alongside you. And that's one of the, the things that I wanted to incorporate was the companion system. Yeah, mm. I think that my favorite companion that Ross wrote in is probably the troll. I love that guy. <laughs> so <laughs> nice. So the most annoying companion in Skyrim was was definitely Lydia, and I'm stuck with her because I play that game with my son, so I can teach him like, no, you can't steal from this person, kind of thing. Like I use it as a teaching thing, and he loves yeah. that girl, and I just want to murder her because she's annoying. 
She's yeah. like, you want to give her this awesome sword? And she says, oh, I'm sworn to carry your burdens. Right. Jerk. And then on top of that, yeah. you give her the good stuff and she keeps using the crap gear. I'm like, no, I gave you a better sword. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there is a way to take away that all that crap gear and have it so she only has good gear. That way she can only use the good yeah, gear. Yeah, you can do that, but she still sometimes, even when you give her good gear, defaults to her her whatever, so not in the inventory, her like her basic gear. Her unarmed yeah, stuff, like basically. It's, it's, she's got oh, weapons when you start, but it's not in the inventory. So I can't take the crap gear yeah. that she starts with from her. And so sometimes like you give her this really you know, expensive best sword ever, and she won't use it. I'm like, oh! <laughs> hey, this is a little bit off topic, but maybe not that much. Did you guys see the trailer for the new Baldur's no. Gate game? See, yes. look it up. No, it, dude, it so, is remember- Lovecraftian horror at its purest <laughs> form. Oh my gosh, that was graphic. I wasn't sure if I was old enough to watch it. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Like, yeah, like, if remember we were talking before, like, sometimes, like, we even realize ourselves, like, oh, man, this is crazy. Okay, now they've gone too far. Like, we all have that line we draw somewhere. I was like, oh, my gosh. As the trailer started to unfold, I had to, like, look around to make sure nobody was looking over my shoulder. (laughs) Like, what am I watching? All right. Uh, I'm going to have to to buy it I'll link the the, uh, trailer in the show notes, dear listener. I'll (laughs) find it on the YouTubes. Because then when I watch it and the wife's like, what are you doing? You're supposed to be working. I'm like, this is work now. (laughs) (laughs) that's That's how i roll all right but this is the moment where we pause and we shamelessly shill for the man the terran empire is dead long live the empire Commander Jared Mertz, the bastard son of the Emperor, and his half-sister, Princess Kelsey, barely speak to one another. To their dismay, their father seizes an opportunity to change that and sends them on a dangerous quest to explore the fallen Empire. Separated from home by an impassable gulf and struggling to redefine their relationship, they find themselves thrust into a vicious war. Unless they work together to stop the Empire's deadly legacy, billions face a horrific fate. Empire of Bones, written by Terry Mixon, now available at Amazon.com. All right, thank you for sticking with us through that commercial interlude. We're back with Jonathan Yanez and Ross, Ross, ooh, speak much, Buzel. See, I did that for you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank so, you. That was my little callback. That's what we call it in the biz. <laughs> you know, we're professional and stuff. All right. right. So when I read the blurb, um, the obvious comparison jumped out at me, Ready Player One. So on my way off, and was this sim- any similarity intentional or happy coincidence? Either one of you can take it. Um, honestly, it, Ready Player One, I never read the book, and it was on the top of my list of movies to see, but I have actually never seen Ready Player One or read the book. So if there was anything that was um, oh, correlated, it was totally coincidental. So this is where I... I <laughs> so I'm on the, I'm the opposite end of that spectrum. I read the book and watched the movie, so that's probably where it came from. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's one of those things where when you have something that becomes iconic... In, in your subgenre, everything is compared to it. You can't get a, mm-hmm. an epic fantasy that isn't somehow compared to Tolkien. So I, I, you wonder how much of that, because I you know, took some of this from the, from the reader reviews. So you wonder how much of that is because it's the, the, the shining beacon on the hill that just everything gets mm. compared, even though like other than the subgenre, nothing is like it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think Ready Player One had a heavy like mystery element and then, of course, adventure. So, and uh, when we were writing the book, I was telling Ross, like, hey, man, like, we need to just make this world massive in scope. Like, let's just keep on opening up loops and asking the readers questions to get them, like, really immersed in our storyline. And, like, let's um, give them a complete story arc for book one, but let's not answer all the questions. Let's leave some of the doors open towards book two. So I think in Ready Player One, they did a good job of asking tons of questions and showing you a scope of like what was possible in this world. And they did a good job of completing the story arc, but there's also so much more story that could be told. So when you go ahead, go Ross. 
Oh, yeah. And um, on on that same topic, um, there are a lot of beats and points in the book that they're not going there's not going to be an answer to um, like lore wise for the sole purpose of um, at least what I want the readers to do is come up with their own lore for these things that don't have a definitive explanation. Oh, OK. All right. So so I got to ask, ask Jonathan, since you've seen the movie and read the book how did they compare because i've read the book but i haven't seen the movie yet i thought the movie did a good job like i i don't know if i could say that the movie was better than the book but i think it's one of those few adaptations where i would say the movie's just as good as the book wow yeah they did a good job all right so this i'm gonna have to rent that this isn't scripted so we're, we're gonna go off but you you mentioned your game and the mechanics and you compared it to the almighty skyrim so i have to ask when you were writing this did you keep any of you were asking yourself like damn someone should make this game so i can play it now oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah i most certainly was i think that's a mark of a good story yep because I'll, i i want to play in the oasis i definitely definitely do what's the oasis that's the uh, that's the game or the kind of the game world of Ready Player One. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, I. I it's totally kind of like uh, Neo was in the Matrix, so you go into the Oasis to play virtual reality. Mm-hmm. So we we had to make sure the scheduling this episode worked with Winder because he's the one who reads all this stuff. So I, I pretty much stick with space opera and and Mill SF. So <laughs> he's more uh, adventurous with his reading. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, I think lit, R- lit RPG could be cool, too, because if you wanted to really dive deep into game mechanics, there's definitely that option where you can read where all the skill points go, where all the leveling systems go, where all the weapons go. But if you wanted to read the story just as an adventure outside of lit RPG, you could always just kind of like peruse those numbers and where all the skills are going. Yeah, and then just read the story itself. I will definitely mm-hmm. add this to the top of my list when I get my next Audible credit. Is this out in audiobook yet or no? So we actually signed uh, contracts with Podium. Oh, wow. So nice. Podium is going to be producing the audiobook. And I don't know, Ross, have you heard like when the release date is? Do you have a release date for yet? I uh, don't have a release date because our um, our voice actor actually is getting married this month. Um, so he's getting married, then going on his honeymoon. But from what I gathered, the tentative schedule is to start beginning or near the beginning of September. Oh, that's not bad. So do you, can you so right about this time this releases? Yeah. So can you say who the uh, narrator is yet? Or is that, um, you know what? I, uh, I don't want to potentially infringe on any, uh, anything that I've signed. So I'm not going to say right now. Um, right. but, uh, that's right. if, yeah. Yeah. That's classified information, Mr. Hanley. <laughs> the only time anyone calls me Mr. Hanley, they want my money. <laughs> well, Mr. Hanley, would you kindly? I, I already told you you have my credit, sir. You have my credit. All right. So some, some okay. of your reviewers compared this story to the works of Alaron Kong. Is it supposed to be King? Did they spell it wrong? No, it's supposed to be Kong. Okay. Got a unique last name. All right. So was this intentional? Any comparison to the to this man's writing? Uh, and full disclosure, I have obviously yet to read his books if I can't even get the name right. Yeah, I think so. I think we pulled uh, – I think in any genre that you're going to write in, it's important to see who is being successful, who understands what the readers want. So I know that I read his first book along with Travis Bagwell. And I think, Ross, you read his, Aleron Kong's first book too, right? Uh, I listened to it. Yeah, yeah listen to it. I listened to it too um, through audiobook. So yeah, definitely wanted to make sure we understood what the fans wanted because Aleron's an awesome writer and he understands what his readers want. So for sure. Okay. What about you, Ross? Since he mentioned Aleron Kong and added Bagwell, uh, Travis Bagwell, were those uh, people you've read? Because that was the other one readers compared it to. Um, well, if, uh, if I'm being completely honest with you, I, uh, the <laughs> only, uh, the only person in lit RPG that I've ever actually read was, has been Alaron Kong. Um, it's, uh, it was sort of a, a new, whenever Jonathan introduced it to me, it was the first time I've, I'd ever heard of lit RPG. So I, um, and he pointed me in the direction of Alaron Kong. That's why I downloaded his book and, uh, and listened to it. Um, but I am in my free time working on trying to, 
expand my uh, my library, so to speak, so I can learn some more from some of the other greats. Yeah, I think what Ross did really well, though, like he tackled it not necessarily from like reading tons of uh, books in the genre, but he has so many years of gameplay. Like, how many times did you play through Skyrim, <laughs> Ross? Two or three times? Uh, no, <laughs> more than that. <laughs> I hope my parents aren't listening, but it's been closer to about eight Sir, or nine. You can't ask questions like that because sometimes our wives might listen, and then. So, so you, you oh. get a my my wife has actually encouraged me to sit down and play Skyrim if I've had a bad day. She'll be like, "No, no, you sit down, you play for a little bit." So my wife's oh, kind of okay with it. Wow, that's a keeper right there, sir. So you'll get a kick out of this. Oh, when is. when I first uh, was was recovering from my head injury, you know, they want you to do things that increase your hand eye coordination, and uh, and one of those things they told me was was like RPGs, games that force you to think, but also because you're fighting, you use use the coordination. So they actually ordered me. I had a doctor's note to play Skyrim uh, when it was Mor- when Morrowind <laughs> was out on the Xbox One, and I, I had that framed oh, right over uh, where where my gaming system was set up. And for some reason, it just accidentally disappeared. That doctor's note. I don't know what my wife was thinking. Must have been the maids. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway well since you a- answered the travis bagwell question we'll move on so uh your reviewers also saw some shades of jumanji which which you mentioned uh earlier as well uh and how the story played out um so was that something you actively leaned into or a- another coincidence just because the genres lined up no for sure i think um, i mean go ahead russ Oh, uh, I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of both Jumanji movies. Um, and so I think that if there was any, uh, if there was anything that lined up, it was unintentional. Um, but subconsciously, of course, uh, with how much I enjoyed the movies, I wouldn't be surprised if something just subconsciously bled over. Sure. Yeah. It's funny because we're both, um, working on the book. I would say like, I, I love Jumanji, both of them. But I'd say especially the one with The Rock, the latest one. So I love that comedy aspect. So I was definitely like yeah. encouraging our characters, you know, to like crack jokes and to bring some levity to the situation that they found themselves in. Okay. Don't cry, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry, don't <laughs> cry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Stuff like that. Like I feel like a good book takes you through the emotional spectrum. Like when I watch a movie or I read a book, I want to like feel sad at some point. I want to feel excited. I want to feel like a little nervous or scared. I want to laugh. I want it all from a book or a movie. Yep. All right. So now onto the story itself and either one of you can answer, but why don't you tell us a little bit about your main character without giving away any spoilers, if you can help it, what makes him or her unique in the, uh, in the world of science fiction? Uh, you want to go first? Yeah, Jonathan? I'll, I'll go first real quick, and then uh, Ross created our main character, but what I really like about him is I feel like he could be almost any of us. Like uh, The reason that Spider-Man resonates so well with readers or viewers is because Spider-Man didn't have a superpower to begin with. He could have been any of us. Just randomly, Mm -hmm. that radioactive spider bit him. So I feel like we have some of that with our main character. Like he's like an every man. He could have been any of us that this situation happened to to get him inside the game. So when you say inside the game, so that's one of the things about lit RPG. I'm not clear. So is it they're playing the game? They go in with virtual reality and play the game, or do they actually get like sucked in to some sort of vortex a la Tron? Well, Mister Hanley, how much of us do you want us to be like? Wait to read the book, or do you want us to divulge all our secrets? <laughs> no, I mean the genre, not necessarily just your book. Oh, the genre, you're in the game. You're something's happened and you are in the game like Jumanji. Okay. With Jumanji, didn't the game come to them like it came into their world, not the other way around, correct? Or did it go both ways? Uh, no. So the Jumanji with the rock, they started playing like a video game and they got sucked into the video See, game. See, I've seen the original. I haven't seen the remake. Oh, I haven't seen that one yet. Yeah. I saw the one with Robin Williams. So in the remake, the... Uh... The cartridge that they have was actually the board game from the original that warped to match the times it was in. Ooh. See, now I got to go watch that. <laughs> which, which is kind of a cool way to tra- to connect the two. That's an evil little board game. Okay. All right. Fair <laughs> enough. All right. So the next question, it's for you, uh, Ross. What uh, what makes your character unique? Um, I, I would have to say that. Um, it's 
I, I, of course, without echoing what Jonathan just said, um, I think that what makes him unique is that um, one of his fundamental, without spoiling anything, one of his fundamental character, quote unquote, flaws, um, I feel like at some point or another, uh, doesn't matter if you're male or female, you have uh, experienced the same sort of uh, tick, I guess you could say, that the main character has in abundance at the beginning of the book. So relatable flaws. Yeah. It, yeah. He's got a, he's got a relatable flaw, but whereas most people typically grow out of it, he hasn't yet. <laughs> Can we say what the relatable flaw is? Cause it's funny. Yes. Um, so his relatable flaw is that he turns into a bumbling idiot around any sort of attractive female. <laughs> Um, to the point where whenever he initially gets his stats, his intelligence stats, I, if memory serves, is 33 because that's how old he is. Um, but in the presence of a beautiful woman, it drops by 13 points. And then, so and, he just, and then Ross, we started him off with uh, – Ross had a great idea of starting off him with his charisma super low too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's not only does he not sound smart, he he doesn't look smart or <laughs> he, he, he just See, he, he's got everything working he, against he, him. He's an ever man. <laughs> <laughs> so so in the reviews, and this isn't one I mentioned because I just left it, but that was one of the comments somebody didn't like, and I'm thinking that kind of makes the guy sound kind of relatable like fun. Like, you know, how many people haven't bombed it when you're trying to uh pick up somebody that you're interested <laughs> in, regardless of like gender or whatever? Like that could be anybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and so. I have to say that was probably one of the more one of the more fun things to write about him was making him that that bit of a clumsy, bumbling idiot in certain situations. All right. So the next question is, uh, what's your favorite secondary character? We'll start with Jonathan. Oh, the troll. So there's a troll merchant. I don't know if I just like the way he talks. He almost reminds me of like a Drax destro- the Destroyer type character, where he says oh, things. He, yeah, yeah. You don't necessarily think it's supposed to be funny, but it is, and it just adds to the comedy that he's like this huge bean, but he just wants he's a merchant. He just wants to sell his merchandise. <laughs> but what ooh, his his merchandise is tiny little delicate handmade glass figurines. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Wow. And he's this like eight foot tall mess of a man. So the reader okay. gets to sit there and just um, wait for something to break. Yeah, yeah, like a bull yes. in a china shop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, right. For me, I'd have to say my favorite secondary character is it's probably Trillian, who's uh, the main character is one of the main characters' uh, companions. Um. Just because it was a lot of fun writing a uh, an Irishman into the book, a, a drunk Irishman. <laughs> nice. So real life, okay. Bada boom. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> okay, send your hate mail to Chris at. <laughs> 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 All right. So finally, does your story have a one main bad guy to that your characters have to confront? Or is it something else? So obviously you don't want to give away spoilers, but who are the uh, is your is your antagonist in this this universe? Um, well, with the way that it's set up uh, in this particular book, there is the elusive dark king, and um, it's legend that once every uh, so many hundred, if not thousands, of years, he rises up, and whenever he rises to power, a natural curse bleeds onto the land. So while there is one main bad guy, his effects are felt throughout the kingdom. Yeah. I think we kind of took a, a note from an actual video game where, you know, there has to be a final boss in a video game that you fight. So yeah, there's lots of different side quests that happen throughout the story, but for sure there's a final boss at the end. Yeah. And just like in video games, there's also mini bosses with difficulty spikes. Yeah. Like the, uh, <laughs> the spider cave. Yeah. What's really cool about the game too, is Ross had this, um, brilliant idea to, with the different books, we could introduce different aspects of like aspects of like uh, sci-fi fantasy. 
So the first one has like trolls and lich kings and werewolves and vampires, which is super cool. But the second book is more uh, Lovecraftian. Okay. Mm. So did you guys put in the all I all knowing iconic uh, rats as your first battle? Like in most RPGs you start for some reason, you have to go into someone's basement and clear a bunch of rats for them as like one of the side. <laughs> uh, no, we, we did not do that for this one. Um, for this one, he's kind of thrown into the deep end without any, uh, without any floaty wings. <laughs> that should that would be fun though. We should make some rat people for book uh, three, Ross. <laughs> uh, you know what? I mean, how many times have you, you know started what? where you've had to fight these these basement full of rats for somebody's shopkeeper to get like a couple gold so you could buy your first armor? Like we should work in that trope oh, yeah, as like but, a side quest. You know what? That would be a great trope, especially since he's at at this point he'd be so overpowered. Yeah, that it's like, could you go clear out the rats? Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, that would be that would be perfect. Yeah, because in book three already he's super strong. Or what if the the rats counter negotiate? <laughs> like, no, go clear out the human. <laughs> Have like a splinter down there. Yeah, I'll double whatever he's offering. <laughs> Master splinter. What's cool about uh, lit RPG too is that since our character was like present day, he understands all these um, different. Uh, things like he he's watched Ninja Turtles, so he could totally go down there and like make a a pun about the rat people looking like Master Splinters. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, that'd and, be fun for the readers too. Yes, yeah, yeah and, we do a ton of that. Yeah, he does make very frequently. He makes references to pop culture, um, and uh, even even makes a couple of references to. Uh, Skyrim or Hellboy. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of pop culture references and tossed in there. <laughs> nice. All right, so Genesis, a lit RPG journey, is clearly part of a series. I know because it says so in the title. And there's currently one book in the series or two now? It's two. So the first book is already out, and the second book it will be out. Well, I guess it depends when this airs, but the second book will be out soon. Okay. Oh, By the time this airs, the second book will already be out. What do we put it that way? So, okay. so <laughs> I started saying two because I just prepped someone else's show notes and they had two. And then I'm like, crap, it's the wrong one. Thank you for covering for me. I appreciate that, John. <laughs> <laughs> Throw me into this. <laughs> so do you already have book three planned? Or it kind of sounds like it's still a little bit up in the air. And, and you said you were a, you're a pantser. You, you ride into the dark. Um, how much planning do you do in advance? Um do you kind of listen to, to what the readers like, or do you just go with what's fun? Well, I'm a pantser, but the way that we have it set up is that Ross takes the first pass in writing the manuscript, and then I take the second pass. And I think, Ross, I don't know if you're 100% pantser. Do you outline a bit? Oh, no, I'm, I'm definitely a pantser. Okay, um, yeah, the the only outlining I did for this was whenever I did a very Dungeons and Dragon-y type thing when, while making the map. Because I remember we um, talked about book three because the first one was more like your traditional fantasy and then we threw in some like vampires, werewolves. The second one mm-hmm. was more like Lovecraftian. And I think the third one, we're going Norse mythology, right? We are because each each section of the, there are four sections in the map and I wanted each section to be just a little bit different. Um, kind of like, uh, yeah, so that way it's not the same it's not more of the same as the readers go through. Okay. So how far is the series going to go? Oh, uh, well right now we have four books definitively planned out. Um, without spoiling, any, spoiling anything though. Um, if the readers want more, I am good with, or I should say we are good with, uh, um, setting it up to be more. <laughs> I'm really nice. enjoying the series. Yeah, one awesome. mistake I made early on in my career was thinking like, oh, okay, like for some reason I would put a certain number of books in my head like, okay, I'm only going to do three or I'm only going to do four. And then no matter what happened, I would do that, close it up and move on to the next series. And then throughout the years, I've realized that like, hey, if fans are in love with or fans like a current series, there's no reason to like leave them hanging and then just stop because you feel like, you know, three was enough. Like if the story is there, you can definitely do more. And it, it, it makes sense for advertising as well because we can advertise, you know, a book one and then there's not just, you know, one or two books after that. 
there's a whole um, series after that that the readers can continue. Right, right. Yeah. Strike while the iron's hot, or what's it uh, Nick Cole's always saying, if you've got the tiger by the tail, hold on? Yeah, if you're giving the, if you've worked so hard to create a brand and you've worked um, to, you know, create like these covers that are fall in line with the storyline and your advertising's on point and readers, the most important thing is that the readers like it. Why would you stop? Yeah. So we know that every universe, every literary universe has its own internally consistent technology and rules of science. So what sort of tech can we expect from these books? FTLs, ray guns, teleporters, spill it, gentlemen. Um, well, this, uh, the technology, in the, at least in the real world that you can, you could expect is just hyper advanced, a hyper advanced gaming system. Um, actually in the game, it's more of medieval era. Okay. So the, the tech there is in line with the medieval era with swords, uh, bows, um, given there is a a touch of mythology to it and, um, naturally magic is involved. Uh, but largely the, the, um, depending on what each city, quote, um, Suppose which what each city was built on, be it magic, metal, um, or stone. That's what each little area thrived in. And really, gentlemen, isn't magic just science we don't understand? <laughs> That's right. <Yeah. laughs> so, so this is kind of stuff my uh, my youngest or my youngest, my oldest is reading. Like he's reading the uh, Sword Art Online stuff. So, is this uh, something that's family friendly, or would you wait a couple years? He's 12. No, we intentionally wrote it so that it would be family friendly. So there's no um, Thanks. There's, there's no scenes or any language or anything like that that he wouldn't be able to read. It's pretty clean. It's pretty tame. I mean, like adventure, like there's some violence, but it's Perfect. not. You know, it's like I would put it on par with like a Marvel movie. If you let him watch Marvel movies, they could read this book. That makes sense. Yeah. That would Perfect. Be a good comparison. Okay, so since uh, there's probably no aliens in this book, uh, how do you come up with the with the monsters? Do, or do you just pull from things that have already been done? Do you co- do you come up with new ones yourself? How does that work? Um, well, when coming up with like the monsters and whatnot for this one, what I like to do is I like to look at obscure lore, like things that aren't well known. Um, so. For example, uh, there's this one very, very mysterious species that I left open-ended um, that um, I took from Native American culture. And it's it's one that I'd never heard of until I, I actively looked it up. Um, and it's not necessarily to try and pass off as anything creative, but more of if there's that one reader who knows what it is, it makes sort of a cool connection between that reader and the series. Oh, yeah, nice. and if you guys okay. have ever played Dungeons and Dragons, we we throw in you know there's a lich mm-hmm. in there in a cave, and then there's yeah. vampires and different creatures like that, and that's been super fun yeah. to explore because writing traditional sci-fi, you don't get to play with that. But I mean, I have very few readers, know very few people who don't enjoy you know a good uh, fantasy as much as they do a good sci-fi like there are out there i'm sure there are people who only are sci-fi purists who won't go near uh, anything fantasy but i think those would be the exception to the rule i think more people are like this who just enjoy a good story yeah Yeah. and and john's been a a D &D tabletop role player since way back i've seen pictures of him huddled over hotel rooms oh yeah playing (laughs) with nick cole and chris fox and oh yeah it's so much fun man i just gave myself Hmm. another shout out (laughs) <laughs> so so well you know what i'm gonna get him out of order and chris is gonna shoot me so so next question please chris <laughs> oh that's my question all right <laughs> <It's funny. laughs> we'll, we'll pretend i'm a professional and we've done this before but okay so i've skimmed the reviews as i always do this helps the right reader find the right books so dear listener please be kind and speak your mind on the reviewing platform The first book in this universe has 34 reviews with a 4.2 star average rating. Uh, Many of the reviews are positive, but when you don't have as many, it only takes one or two to to drag it down. So uh, if you look, there's, there's a very um, distinctive spread, the few one stars and then 
everything else is five stars, pretty much. Uh, so when I read through the negative review, which can be equally helpful in proper book selection, I did see one trend. The the readers that didn't like it didn't agree with your game mechanics and how you set that up. So does that surprise you? Um, I mean, not, not really. Um, and like you said, uh, any, um, any kind of review is helpful, whether it be negative or positive. Um, and, uh, with those negative reviews that said they don't like game mechanics, that's just something that, uh, um, uh, Jonathan and I can look at and then moving forward, um, tweak without breaking the, the immersion of the series, um, to help make it be a little bit more um, understanding to the reader. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, you guys have plenty of books out there, so you know it's impossible to please everybody. So Mm -hmm. when multiple reviews say something, I think it's definitely worth looking at. But no matter how many books that we write until, you know, we're hunched over the keyboard with arthritic hands and gray hair, until, (laughs) you know till the end of time, we will never write a book that will make everybody happy. Yeah. So one of the, the tricks I've learned in, in doing all this review hunting as I prep for these shows is follow it back to the person who left the review. And sometimes you'll find that there are books they like and they didn't like. Okay, so it is what it is. Some of the people that leave bad reviews, if you look, they don't like anything. Like yeah. one of the bad reviews I got I looked at it and it's like, oh, you also thought David Weber was a hack and, you know, Nick Cole was a hack and all these, <laughs> oh man, I gave myself another show. No, but, but some people you know, you'll realize that nobody makes them happy. Yeah. I mean, after, so. I don't know how many reviews I have across all my books, but I read all my reviews and I think it used to bother me maybe like in the first few years of writing. And what I used to do is I would go look at Stephen King's one star reviews and JK Rowling's one star reviews and Tolkien's one star reviews. I'm like, dude, if these guys are getting one star reviews, then I'm in good company. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. So now into the positive um, reviews. Uh, all your fans th- seem to think you nailed it with the blending of of action and backstory and world building. So man, how how'd you make this how'd you make it work? Did you have like a uh, like a revolving cycle or or just whatever seemed to come up? Um well, a, a lot of it actually had to do with what I referenced earlier, that um, Dungeons & Dragons dice uh, map-making uh, scenario that I did, which was take a big sheet of cardboard and drop a fistful of Dungeons & Dragons dice on it, um, everything from regular D4 to D20, and um, assign you know cities, forests, rivers, mountains to certain dice numbers. Um, and certain dice size. And I think that really helped with uh, building the building the world um, and helping create sort of the immersion. Um, so there, there was a little bit of planning, but a lot of it was like, as you guys put it, uh, since I'm a pantser, a, lo- a lot of it is um, letting the character grow into mm-hmm. the story w- with you. And a cool aspect that we added that was important to us from the beginning was not only party building, like who the main character was going to have in his camp and his party, but base building as well. So we knew he had mm-hmm. to have like, you know, a really cool uh, home base and that that would evolve and grow with him as a character as he grew. And as he grew and gained a status in the land, that more people would want to be part of what he was changing or be part of his party. So that's been a lot of fun, too, to see, like, his uh, holdings grow and his party as well. So you said party building, and I'm thinking what beverages you're drinking and, you know, like that kind of party. So mm-hmm. cl- clearly I, I've been tainted by my years in the barracks. <laughs> so. uh, yeah. So, like, um, <laughs> characters that he discovers are, like, people that want to come and, like, you know, bow a knee to his flag, to his banner. Like people that he'll come across or beans like this troll in the market and stuff like that who will then go to his um, castle and like want to be part of his crew. And, okay. and building into that as well is it it wasn't just like uh, um, the people who uh, either wanted to or were given a choice to join, but he was also given um, – he was also given an opportunity to put certain people in certain er- in certain roles, 
Um, so like Ertan, the, uh, the, um, orc that likes to make the little glass figurines, um, he is really good at the market. And so, uh, the main character could choose to either put him in the market where he would thrive or put him out to work on the farms where he would actually bring in a negative yield of crop because he doesn't know how to farm. (laughs) Wow. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. So you get pretty deep into like mechanics. I think, um, wasn't it the werewolf that ended up being his, uh, like in charge of his estate, Ross? Uh, the werewolf, the alpha werewolf ended up being the captain of the night guard. His wife, his wife yeah. who, uh, his wife who was used to running packs and like making sure that the packs of werewolves got to got along properly. She was the one that was put in charge of handling the estate as a steward. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's more detailed than I would have expected. <laughs> yeah. So, it's uh, crazy detail. That's what I told Ross when we started working together. I'm like, dude, if I could ask your help in anything, it would be just like making sure that like the leveling systems, that the armor and gears that gear that he carries and stuff like that is like on point. Cause I know I struggle sometimes with all the details that goes into something like this. So when I, when I played uh tabletop, uh, games, I tended to be more like the murder hobo kind of guy. So, <laughs> you know, or shmore, let's just kill somebody. Uh, and I'll link the, I'll link the, uh, for this, instead of linking a definition of a murder hobo, I'm just going to li- link the Mikey Mason song, which explains it pretty well. He's, he's a awesome singer. Are you like that player? Who's like uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger in commando when they tell you to go in stealthy, you just like go and shooting up everybody. If one bullet is good, a hundred is better. <laughs> Accuracy <laughs> through volume. That's, so, uh, well, funny, funny story. Before I was a squad designated marksman, I was actually the the saw gunner. So, like, I, I did carry that thing, and nothing makes somebody who carries the various you know unit level machine gun happy than they getting to lighten the load and fire all those rounds. <laughs> what? There's a squirrel in the tree. Let me take the tree down for you. <laughs> So before uh, before we wrap this up, are there any updates besides the audiobook, which should be dropping s- close-ish when this uh, episode airs? Are there any other uh, forms of media coming out? So uh, role-playing games, tabletop or otherwise, movies, video games, etc.? Because this sounds interesting and I would play it. Thanks. Yeah. So I think right now we just have book two should be out by the time this airs because it should be out from like a, a week or two from now. We're just going through editing. And then the audiobook should be out uh, like what you said as close to when this airs but as of right now those are the two means that we have going um but there that doesn't mean that there wouldn't be a tabletop game or something like that in the future okay oh yeah i'd totally be on board with uh working with jonathan to develop that tabletop game because oh. yeah that'd be a lot yeah of for sure and then ross i don't know if you can talk about that pitch that you were talking to me about i don't know if that's a secret or not Oh no, it's it's not a secret. It's uh, it's a bit of a long shot as of right now, but it's not a secret. Um, yeah, I built my career so on long in, shots. Uh, long shots are good. That's true. Uh, in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, the town that my wife is from, um, there is a comic book company called Lion Forge, and they don't often take unsolicited. Um, they don't often take unsolicited unsolicited um, submissions, but every once in a while, if they're given a product that is of a high enough quality, they will take it on and turn it into a comic book. Um, and so I, with of course, Jonathan's permission, I wrote up a, uh, um, a pitch to him and, um, again, submitted it to, to Jonathan to, to, uh, to look over cause I hadn't done a, a pitch like that before and submitted it to lion forge comics, um, for fingers crossed, uh, a hope that they will, Want, would want to pick it up and potentially turn Legends Online into a comic book. That is awesome. So we've actually reached out for one of Winder and I co-wrote Breach Team, and we uh, we reached out to Hazard Studios uh, with Walt Robillard and uh, seeing if we can turn that into an RPG. Just you know, as a learning curve for uh, for our bigger series that that we th- think would be a, a good fit as well. So there's definitely small RPG companies out there that that you could do that too. And now I'll throw Hazard Studios and Walt in the show notes. Yeah, that's the great thing about creating IP intellectual properties is that I think early on I made the mistake, and I think maybe some authors think this too, that we're just writing books. So we could sell, you know, ebooks and paperbacks. 
and then it's the next ebook and paperback we work on and we just write books so on and so on but like what you guys already realized and what ross realizes with comic books is that there's so much more there's so many different revenue streams like you know audiobooks comic books role-playing games uh, mobile games film you know there's so many different revenues that you can turn that uh, intellectual property into so that was our thinking. So I'm not sure how much regular ebook readers of the science fiction genre translate or, or paperback translate into RPG sales. But we were hoping is the RPG players that might see the game and try it and then say, oh, there's a book in this universe and read that mm-hmm. and see coming the other direction we might catch. Because, I mean, look at how Warhammer 40K has done. Like there are some people that the only books they read are, are Warhammer because it's in the game they love. You know, yeah. Did so, you guys hear that Warhammer is getting a TV show as well? I did. I thought what? it was like the internet <laughs> spoof. Like supposedly, uh, Last Starfighter is going to get a sequel, but they've been saying yeah. that for like the last twenty years. So, no, we're living in a great age for content right now with Disney Plus about to launch, and then Amazon and Netflix buying up rights like bananas. Like Netflix doing The Witcher, Chronicles of Narnia, The Wheel of Time. Ooh. I don't know. I don't know if it was Netflix or Amazon doing the Wheel of Time. One of them is. I think that one. That, that one might be Hulu. Uh, can we put that in the show notes, Mister Winter? Yeah, Gerald, do it. <laughs> so I have Witcher, <laughs> the Chronicles of Narnia. What was the third one? Uh, I know for sure Chronicles of Narnia and uh, Witcher are Netflix. I, I don't know about the Wheel of Time. If that one's Amazon or Netflix. All right, and uh, they're doing another um, another Tolkien. Uh, in one of the Forgotten Ages. Yeah, on, yeah, uh, yeah. Amazon picked on up on Amazon. It. So yeah, so I mean, there's wow. so much content being pumped out, and these guys are going to war with each other. I mean, let alone HBO, right? And all the Game of Thrones spinoffs that they're going to develop. It's like this is a yeah. great time for us as writers. Before be they do right the now. spinoffs, can they finish the main dang series there, Georgie? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> oh man, we could have an episode about that alone. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But we're 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 running long because uh, the gift of the gab with us. You got me talking about Skyrim, and it's so it's it's really Ross's fault if you think about it. Um, but uh, was, there, <laughs> it, was there anything about the Legends Online series or Genesis, a lit RPG journey in particular, that we didn't ask that you wanted to tell us about before we moved on? Uh, I think I touched on it uh, earlier. But even if you're not a fan of lit RPG, if you just want to have go on a great adventure. If you wanted to, you know, skip those detailed parts of the leveling systems and the weapons and stuff like that, if you're just a casual reader of the genre, like you can still have a great experience and not be a hardcore fan and not be, um, not feel like you're going to miss out by reading all, you know, the tiny details. It's almost just kind of like an extra perk. Like those tiny details are there for, you know, hardcore fans of the genre, but it's really for any fan of like sci-fi fantasy. Okay. And and um, on uh, on top of that, those tiny details are uh, are done in uh, italicized and in a different. Uh, they're set to the center margin as well, uh, um, unlike Times New Roman, like you like Jr. Gang <laughs> straight. Uh, uh, and to the to the uh, right margin. That way, it does stick out from the rest of the book. So if you didn't want to read that, it would be easy to skip over. It. Oh, very nice. All right, so um, we've we've touched on this. We're gonna we're gonna have to wrap some of these questions up, dear listeners. So you won't get the usual complete closeout. Uh, and they they wrote this um, this novel in the humorous subgenre of science fiction. So instead of asking you about the uh, genre at large, where you tell us everything you love and hate about it, how about answer this for us? How what is the level of comedy in your in your series? Uh, how are we grading the level of comedy? Are we grading it from we'll like say, the most depressing thing we've watched to the funniest thing we've ever heard? Yeah, most. Let's say um, on a scale, Cthulhu uh, is a one, and Monty Python is a ten. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we're going Monty Python as the bar, then it's definitely closer to Monty Python. <laughs> yeah, I would say closer to Monty Python. I was trying to think of the same thing. You're so fast, Mister Winder. I was trying to think of like something like that, and I got as far something as the extreme. notebook. The notebook being super depressing. I was going to start there, and then I was in the process of thinking like a funny one, but you're fast. Um, yeah, so like, if Monty Python was ten, and Cth- what did you say, Cthulhu? Yeah, yeah, Cthulhu was one. I what do you think, Ross? Like, I would say funnier, so maybe like six or seven. 
I would I would say six or seven, especially because it is in the vein of that dry humor. So cheeky. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. And just just for the record, because the uh, the old ones listen, I, I want you to know, Cthulhu, you still have my vote in 2020. <laughs> 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 All right. And uh, and we have uh, you, you wrote it in the mage gaming subgenre. Uh, of humor and entertainment and the strategy gaming subgenre. So what uh, if we're, we're just going to combine them? Because t- when I wrote them separate, but I really can't see much of a difference between the two. It's still gaming. So so what is your biggest pet peeve in the subgenre of of mage and or strategy gaming? Pet peeve? Yeah. What's your biggest pet peeve? I don't know if I have a, a the biggest pet peeve. I know that um, Dakota Kraut, who writes lit RPG as well does really well in those categories. So when I was doing my research on lit RPG, I saw that he had a heavy presence in there as well as some of the other lit RPG guys. So that's where I placed my book because I think that's where the readers are. But I don't think I have a pet okay. peeve with the genres. Okay. Yeah. Um, and same here. At least, uh, yeah, at least not in the, the as uh, a book goes. I wouldn't say I have a pet peeve. Okay. So what do you think your, um, what's your favorite lit RPG book right now? Besides your own, of course. Um, I, uh-huh. I don't know. I guess I would have to go with Aleron Kong series. I think he does it well and it's just a lot of fun. Uh, I listen to the audio books like, uh, what Ross does. So the narrator they have for it is awesome. He's able to put on like a performance or like maybe two years ago, I really dove into audiobooks and, I don't know what most people think who don't listen to audiobooks. Maybe they think it can be just like a dry, monotone narrator. And there definitely are those. But if you get a good narrator, it's like a performance. You're like there, right there with them, and you're right there with all the characters. Yep. I, I was so, just checking my uh, my Audible yeah. right now. Because the guy does like accents and different voices and everything. Yeah. yeah I was checking my Audible right now. That's what I'm listening to right now is is The Land, uh, yeah. Founding Cassie's book one. Yes. I'm so intrigued by this book. What is it? It's called The Land? Yeah, The Land, yeah, colon, Founding, colon, Chaos Seeds, colon, book one. Yeah, it's just fun. And Chaos Seeds makes a lot of sense once you get into the book, what, what that means. Right. Okay. So the um, – okay. So normally we would ask you what you're reading, but like I've got pages of show notes of everything you've read and prepped <laughs> for this. So I'm going to assume – that uh, that we already know the answer to that, and we're going to move on. Uh, and the other part of this uh, wrap up session, dear listener, is we normally ask them about the science that makes science fiction fun. However, we are pre-recording this way in advance uh, because our uh, August slots are going to be filled up us interviewing the Dragon Award finalists, like we do every year. So instead, let's ask a lit RPG question. So all of you can answer. If you had to be sucked into any game out there, which one would you desperately want to avoid? <laughs> if you dark need souls to, oh dark souls okay why <laughs> um because how you're introduced into the game is as soon as you spawn in um the very first thing that you come across kills you and you get a trophy that says welcome to dark souls okay um, the long and short of it you die a lot <laughs> <laughs> that could be mildly painful a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What about you, Jonathan? I don't know, man. I think the Game of Thrones world is pretty brutal. Is that a game? Uh, yeah. I, mean, I know game, game is in the it, title. Yeah. Oh, it does. They have, okay. they have multiple versions of the game. But I mean, what? maybe season one Game of Thrones, I'd be okay. Last season Game of Thrones, it'd just be depressing. Okay. What about you, Winder? Uh, definitely Dishonored. Because there's nothing but plague, zombies, swarms of rats that want to eat people. Uh, and everybody, everybody wants to kill you. Fair enough. Yeah. And for me, it, it would have to be the Warhammer 40 K universe for obvious grim, dark reasons. All right. And because we want to end on a positive note in which game would you like to get sucked into and why? And we will start with you, Jonathan, which game would I like to be sucked into? I know it's probably not a common answer, but my favorite game these days, my favorite franchise is gears of war. So I can definitely see myself out there along with the cog and Marcus Phoenix slaying some some aliens. I think that'd be fun. Just is this is it just because you want to hit the gym with them? 
Yeah, probably. Uh, <laughs> Assassin's Creed for the same reason. I was playing the most recent Assassin's Creed. It, even though it's probably not like a common answer, like you want to be like in ancient Greece, I would do that too in a second. Okay. So uh, next, what about you, Ross? Oh, uh, I would have to say probably... That's a tough one. It'd probably be either the original Mass Effect series or Skyrim, prim- because I'd love to be able to Fusro Daw something off of a mountaintop. <laughs> okay. All right. And what about you, Winder? Uh, for me, it'd be Borderlands. I, I just like the tech. Dude, like, did you know like there's the a new view. Borderlands game coming out? Are you uh, serious? Yeah. Yeah, I saw that Borderlands 3, I think, is what it is. Yeah, next month. It's coming out soon. Yeah, so That's I've awesome. got the prequel in Borderlands 2. Yeah. All right. And you, Jer? So it would have to be one where I wouldn't die. So maybe Star Trek, because unless you wore the red shirts, you didn't really die in that hippy-dippy utopia. So (laughs) living is good. (laughs) All right. So now that we've we've gone through all of our questions and we've kept you for an hour and a half to your listener, let's uh, wrap this party up by asking you, Jonathan, how can listeners find you? And as usual, all links will be in the show notes. Yeah, so just uh, website, jonathan-yanez.com. Mr. Hanley was so kind to add my Facebook group into the show notes, which I read thoroughly before this interview. (laughs) That that included my Facebook group, Jonathan's uh, Reading Wolves. So you can just type that into uh, Facebook. And then you can just type my name into like Amazon or Google. It's Y-A-N-E-Z. Outstanding. And Ross, how can listeners find you? Uh, well, right now I'm working on building uh, my presence, but uh, the best place to find me would be on my Facebook uh, my Facebook group. It's called Ross's OWS. Um, yeah, that's the that would be the best place to find me. Okay, and Winder, how can they find us if they should so desire? And you do, people. <laughs> Our website is www.sfshenanigans.com. Our Twitter handle is at SFS, that's Sierra Foxtrot Sierra underscore show. Our email is podcast at sfshenanigans.com. And our Facebook group is facebook.com slash groups slash sfshenanigans. Thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For Chris Winder and Saskia Smalls, I'm J.R. Hanley, and this was the Sci-Fi Shenanigans Podcast. We'll be back next week at the same time where we'll indulge our love of space and all things that go boom. All right. Thank you for sticking with us through that uh, archived episode that was in the uh, in the digital memory hole that we found. We thought you'd enjoy it. So thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For Nick Garber and Doc Seska, I am J.R. Hanley, and this was the archive for the Blasters and Blades podcast. We'll be back at our regular scheduled time where we'll indulge our love of nerd culture, cheesy jokes, and all things that go boom.